join the conversation now as Marination's host, Sharon Skolnick Bagnoli, discusses with Len and Libby Traubman their over 20 years of Palestinian Jewish living room dialogue for peace. Hello, and welcome to Marination's. My name is Sharon Skolnick Bagnoli, and today I am here with Len Traubman and Libby mm -hmm. Traubman, who are the founders of something called Living Room Dialogues. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, can you please tell me, Len, what Living Room Dialogues are? Well, uh, as you describe, they, we meet in homes, and we're part of a 20-year-old Palestinian Jewish Living Room Dialogue that started in our home of July 1992 after we had brought together globally uh, Palestinians and Israelis to California, to the Redwoods, because it was illegal for them to meet over there. Mm -hmm. But what was determined at that coming together was that uh, for any government process to work, there has to be an authentic citizen-to-citizen -citizen relationship building pro pro process, right. because that is really the only way that an authentic trust can be built. So we just gathered people in our living room to see how it works. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me something about how those meetings do work? We have lots of stories about how the meetings work and how they don't work. Uh, when we first started the living room dialogue, we, were, we knew we had something that was important, as Lynn just said, and we were calling it the public peace process. But we, what we really didn't understand was exactly how dialogue was going to work in the living room. So in the early days, I would say there wasn't a lot of dialogue. There was more lecturing and pontificating and people sharing their strong opinions and sometimes feeling so satisfied that then they just didn't feel a need to come back. So it took us <laughs> several months to realize what dialogue is and what it is not and what we wanted it to really be. And so after those few months, we began to settle into the true purpose of dialogue, which is learning how to listen and to listen to learn from each other. And what mm -hmm. we learned through that process was it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. But that was the early days and the beginning, and everything kind of just has grown from those uh, first meetings mm -hmm. and finding the right participants mm -hmm. and just seeing where it would take us. So how did you figure out what would work as dialogue? Did you read books about it, or did you just come to it by trial and error? Well, most of what we would talk about wouldn't be theory, but really what works in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And what we learned was that a lot of people wanted peace, but they didn't want relationships. Mm -hmm. And in the living room, like in the rest of the world, the quality of listening was not good at first. A lot of people uh, want to speak, but fewer people w want to listen to one another. And that we also learned about the value of story, and that an enemy is one whose story we have not heard. So we knew that uh, it was not to start w about issues, but to really humanize the other by hearing their, their personal narratives, how they experience life, and to discover the human being in the other room that we were uh, talking about the future with. Did you, um, did you ask each other, did you ask the people that were there to limit um, how they responded or to not speak when the others were speaking, that kind of thing? Did yeah, you we, we of? definitely had to do that. After we formed our basic group, our core group that was mm -hmm. balanced with uh, Palestinians and Jews and a few others, we had meetings to uh, form our guidelines and mm -hmm. what did we agree to about how long we would listen, how we would pass the talking mm -hmm. stick, so to speak, how we wouldn't interrupt, and how we would, we would do our best not to judge, but to try to do our very best to take in what the person was saying mm -hmm. and not argue about it. We weren't there to argue. We were there just to learn. gather and learn the different perspectives and ideas and meanings that people brought into the room. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it took time, you know, it wasn't an easy thing because people are used to just talking when they want to talk and talking as long as they want to without being conscious of taking the time or sharing the time with other people. 
do uh, in one of these uh, dialogue sessions, is there some kind of summary toward the end or does it just kind of, how do you know when to end these sessions? Well, they end uh, at 9.30. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, any of the, a useful conversation can go on a long time. So time mm -hmm. is important. And we, had a re <laughs> we just made a film called Dialogue in Nigeria, Muslims and Christians Creating Their Future, because we were asked to go over to Africa to bring together several hundred Muslims and Christians. Mm -hmm. And there's a part in the film where Libby is saying, uh, because they had a hard time, like everybody does, really being still and listening. And she said, when you are doing that, you are stealing time from the other person. And it was very mm. powerful to say that. So we're careful to uh, bring out people who have a hard time expressing themselves and then to ask others to please share time. Mm -hmm. What were your backgrounds uh, before you got into this? Or did mm -hmm. you, ha I know you're, you're a dentist, aren't you? I was a pediatric dentist for uh, 38 years. Uh -huh. yep. And, and I was a social worker. I had a master's in social work, and I did practice several years before we were married and several years after we were married. But most of my mm -hmm. experience didn't come from being a social worker. It came from being a mother and doing volunteer work and the community. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, I had a few skills mm -hmm. uh, from participating in the uh, graduate programs, but most, li most of the things that I think we both learned was just doing it, seeing what worked and what didn't work. Mm -hmm. you and know, one of the things that we're seeing, Sharon, is that a lot of people study about conflict resolution and yeah. have academic uh, degrees, but uh, really this has to be practiced in real life and that uh, there's nothing that replaces face-to-face -face relationship. So most of what we learned, or mm -hmm. what we talk about, would be actually in our marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Libby said, parenting. And in time, working with people and uh, getting better at it, getting better at listening, mm -hmm. expressing ourselves, and, uh, and just making it easier and providing safe places for other people to come together. Right, the idea of the living room as being a safe place, mm -hmm. and it's your home. Did you ever, were you ever afraid in using your own home this no, way? No, you know, we, we go from home to home. We don't, oh, okay. just, we don't just meet in our home. Yeah, we yeah. go to everybody's home. We all take turns, mm -hmm. which is another way of getting to know each other. You see what somebody's house looks like and what their artifacts are and what kind of food they like. So there's a lot more to it than just sitting in one person's home and mm -hmm. talking. We always have food beforehand. It got to be really almost a joke because there was like, whose house could provide the best food? Was it the Jewish house or was it the Palestinian <laughs> house? Mm -hmm. So it was kind of cute, but we always have some yeah. really good uh, treats before the meetings begin and people just come in and hang out and socialize mm -hmm. and then the same thing Len said we end at 9 30 we try to mm -hmm. but we all everybody always stays much longer and hangs out after the meeting right. to eat some more and to visit some more because real relationships and friendships have obviously developed over the years have they between yes. the two yes. mm. cultures and i think yeah. a lot of people socialize outside mm -hmm. the uh monthly meetings. That's great. They have dinners with each other, go to each other's birthdays and anniversaries and mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you get new people uh, or is it the same group that's been coming for years? It's been, uh, we try to keep the group the same core group because we've built those relationships. However, mm -hmm. there have been people in our group who've died. We've had some people who've gotten married and moved on. So over the 20 years, needless to say, we have had new people who've wanted to participate. We kind of have a waiting list and we want to keep the group balanced. Mm -hmm. So we bring in new people who really want to be in the group and are willing to commit and sustain to participating as regularly as possible. Okay, so it's not a drop-in kind no. of thing. You want people to, right. no. to stay with it. So how would you put it uh, about how the dialogue is different now from when you started in 1992. I know you've been skirting that or talking about that mm -hmm. a bit, but I'd like to hear it as a, you know. Well, the dialogue is, ex the process has expanded while the group itself is our 
home base, it's where mm -hmm. we deepen, we have moved out into the community, into yeah. the nation, and around the planet. And the action of dialogue is building relationships. So we've helped people uh, in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, in the Middle East. We brought hundreds of Palestinians and Jews, Muslims, Christians, and Jews from the Middle East to live together at a, at a mountain retreat uh, in a residence camp near Yosemite. Mm -hmm. And we facilitated people in Singapore, whole auditoriums of people in Singapore by Skype. So, and yeah, helped nice many other thing. nations in, uh, in Africa mm -hmm. to use the videos that we made, the film that we made to document all of these activities. And we just moved into campuses and, and uh, many states around the country mm -hmm. to give other people the tools and pass it on. That's great. Did you ha always have this larger, pic bigger picture vision that it was going to be a world level thing? No, mm -hmm. we had no idea. When we started the dialogue in our living room, we didn't know whether it would last six months or two years or three years. But as time went on and mm -hmm. kind of things began to unfold, uh, we could see that you know, Len always said, it's important to tell the story. You can't just have this little group meet in the living room. You have to talk about it as a model. So mm -hmm. once we felt we had something to communicate and that we had been learning together, Len started a website. Mm -hmm. And once mm -hmm. the website got going, we started getting requests from people who found the website and said, I want to do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that caused us to say, oh my gosh, how can we help these people do what we're doing? And so we right. had to start uh, uh, identifying some processes and some rules we could put on paper. Right. And then we had a, a news anchor that came into the room who did this 10 minute story on us. Mm -hmm. And so we, this was before DVDs. So for a couple of years, we sent a 10 minute VHS mm -hmm. showing the living those. room dialogue. Yeah, yeah remember those? <laughs> to people who ask for information. Yeah. So we've just, over the years, it's been like a, when the request comes, we try to meet it. Mm -hmm. And we try to respond to those requests and be supportive as possible. So it's helped us learn, it's helped us create, it's helped us uh, mm -hmm. engineer new ways of communicating. And then right. suddenly we got into the filmmaking and we made a film about the Peacemakers Camp that Len just talked about. Mm -hmm. So as it got more simple, out of the VHS, we could I got send, the, send DVDs around, which was much easier and less costly. Right. So it's been a process. What's the website uh, URL name? Well, uh, if people just Google Jewish-Palestinian Living Room Dialogue, they'll come to the website. Okay. And also, or Jewish-Palestinian videos. Mm -hmm. These are examples of DVDs. One is called Dialogue at Washington High. That's just over here in Fremont where we mm -hmm. went to a school. Another is Peacemakers, Palestinians and Jews together at camp. And then of course our experience in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. A dialogue in Nigeria, Muslims and Christians creating their future. And these are all free of charge and we mail them everywhere, anywhere in the world to people who simply send an email just right. to move this whole process of uh, civil engagement around the planet. Have you ever disagreed with one another about the structure or the purpose or the mm -hmm. content of the dialogues? And how do you work out your own disagreements about these things? Uh, we as a couple, you mean? Yeah. And um, in general? No, we fight about other things. <laughs> <laughs> I think we mm -hmm. usually pretty much agree on uh, the process that we've been doing in the Jewish-Palestinian living room dialogue, mm -hmm. sometimes we've had uh, differences in mm -hmm. how far reaching we can be or how far out to go. You know, like we had, a, it was a big decision to go to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so mm -hmm. much that we had, we too had a fight, but we together struggled with, was this the right thing to do? Were mm -hmm. we capable of doing this by ourselves without a team? Right. So we've had lots of challenges like that. But to say more about that, yeah. that uh, because we're two people and that we have strong opinions and, and views of life and we come from our own conditioning, mm -hmm. from different kinds of families, we do have conflicts frequently. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that have, has moved us to resolve our conflicts is to have that view of the whole planet. Mm -hmm. And to have the vision, li just like you have on the <laughs> table there. And we really feel like if we don't resolve our own conflicts, then there is not hope for right. the planet. And we have, feel that responsibility is up to us, and we must resolve our mm -hmm. conflicts. And that's what motivates us. Mm -hmm. So oh, great. Th yes. That's what one of the people in your video said. I think it was a woman in Nigeria. She uh -huh. said, if you want peace in the world, it has to start with you, yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's a, a beautiful philosophy. Uh, I wonder how that interfaces in your minds with what goes on in the world and, and what happens when there's escalation of, mm -hmm. of um, anger, hatred, um, revenge. Um, how do you um, balance those things in terms of what you think is going on in the world in your own work? It's all the same. It's all one. And uh, one of the things, what goes on in the world, especially the violence, one of the things that we've learned is even in raising children, if you're going to reject violence and not get into spanking, you have to pre-decide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a pre-decision about the use of violence itself. And so that people in the world have to decide that at home and for the planet. It's all one. And also decide to still themselves and to listen to one another and to realize that an enemy is someone whose story we have not heard. And mm -hmm. this is the, to dignify somebody like that. It dignifies the listener. It dignifies the person you're asking to tell their story. This is the beginning of the end of war. Ver not humiliating, but dignifying the other, even the enemy. Right. You know, one of the experiences that we had that really kind of led us into this direction was in 1984, we went to the Soviet Union for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And that was the time during the Cold War when the United States and the Soviet Union were posing each other as the evil empire, the awful enemy. And we went there and what we did is we shared our personal stories with each other. This was in hospitals and clinics, because this was through the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. So we went to these medical settings, we told our personal stories, including what we were taught about the other. Like we were taught to fear those awful communists. We were taught to fear the Soviet Union because they were out to get us. We told our stories, mm -hmm. we saw each other as so human and so equal and so similar that there was actually crying and embracing mm -hmm. and this deep appreciation for this new information, this new way of coming together mm -hmm. and being together and saying what we are about is just ridiculous. And at the time, we didn't know how much that was going to factor in mm -hmm. moving out with the Palestinian and Jewish uh, relationship and how telling the story was so profound. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of one of the things that we said right from the very beginning, that in the dialogue group, we would always start by telling our personal narratives right. because that is what breaks that barrier mm -hmm. of seeing each other as not human and not equal. Have you, uh, I asked you before if you'd been to Israel and you said yes, you have been to Israel. Um, did you ever consider taking your core group to Israel and having this there publicly or, you know, inviting other people in. People talk about going over there, and many of us have traveled over there individually, but what we found actually works better is we have brought hundreds of uh, women and men and families from 50 different towns in Israel and Palestine to uh, a resident camp uh, near Yosemite National Park to actually have the experience of living together mm -hmm. and communicating like they never ha thought they, they would. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we send the people back home with tools. And that is the way that we found, we did that for five years in a row at Camp Tawanga. Mm -hmm. uh, Osei Shalom Sane Asalam was the name of the camp. And there's a film about it and all the films we've made stream online. So they're all available, those models for people to see and emulate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those people did take what they learned at camp and the various skills and activities that we did together. And they've had their own seminars and their own camps and they bring the high school kids together and the college students and they do their own uh, different kinds of activities bringing people together. And the sad thing is, is we don't 
hear that through our newspapers and our media, uh, but there are lots and lots of activities at a very grassroots level yeah. going on between women cooking together and birthing, helping each other birth their children and have, having schools, hand-in-hand -hand school, where the students are Arab and Jewish together. There are so many wonderful programs where the citizens are beginning to discover that they can be together and learn how to live cooperatively together. Is that happening in Israel or, and in Palestine also, or just mostly in Israel? Uh, the, the programs she just described yeah. are happening mostly in Israel, but also there is cross-border communication. Sometimes the programs are across borders, uh -huh. but because the borders are so closed now, yeah. it's a little more difficult. Yeah. But still, if the models being inside of Israel is very important because just as almost no Jews and no Palestinians ha have ever met before, <laughs> these are two beautiful people who have, yeah. except for a tiny handful of people who have ever engaged, that is true inside the state of Israel as well. Yeah. So the model anywhere is a useful model. Right. Did, do you think that uh, the Arabs should learn Hebrew and the Israelis should learn Arabic? Our experience is that when we bring them together, they, they both speak a common language and that's English. Mm -hmm. But one thing we have learned about language is that when something has great meaning for somebody, it's very important to pause and take time and allow them to express it in their own mother tongue. Right. And to take time and have an interpreter and to dignify people that way. It's so, it means so much to people and so it's so important. Do you have an interpreter at your Living room dialogues usually? No, never, because they all speak English. Okay. Some of them, ha you know, have heavy accents, but everybody speaks English. Right. I had thought something about uh, objects and items you might use or not use, and what you thought about it. Do you? I said, do you prefer sitting in a circle? Mm -hmm. Do you incorporate candles or ethnic music? Do you pray together? Do you share ethnic dance, mm -hmm. drama, poetry? Mm -hmm. What do you think about using those kinds of things in these mm -hmm. kinds of meetings? I think it's really important. And like I said, we go to each other's houses to see what art, artifacts, and things that give, serve beauty and have meaning to the person mm -hmm. and the people who live in mm -hmm. that house. At the camp, in mm -hmm. our uh, meetings, we often will light a candle, especially if something sad or bad has happened uh, to either in within Israel or the uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Gaza or their West Bank. We we don't often pray together. Um, there are people in the group who say that they're not religious, uh, but we do have people talk about their religious ceremonies, like during the high holidays or mm -hmm. Christmas or Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. We ask people who, sh who celebrate those occasions to share with the group what, what it means to them. Mm -hmm. But in terms of kind of a group or universal prayer, I would say it would be more the lighting of a candle and thinking more holistically together. Just four weeks ago in San Francisco, we brought together 120 Palestinians and Jews at St. Ignatius mm -hmm. uh, high, uh, College Preparatory High School. And to open that evening, we had a ceremony where there were nine tables and with a Palestinian and Jew at each candle on the table, and each of them lighted a candle mm -hmm. to acknowledge the year, to acknowledge our progress, to uh, put in, just to acknowledge together as a single experience, mm -hmm. our vision to bring light and relationships, uh, not only to the Middle East, but around the planet. So that was That's ceremony, great. we do use ceremony. Yeah, well, I and was music. interested because each side in this particular, mm -hmm. uh, in the Middle East, um, draws from that, whether they individually yes. practice or not. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious, Libby, you, you were not raised Jewish, so Correct. what is it that you draws you to do this, and what do you see uh, in, mm -hmm. each, in people's expression of each of those cultures, f since you're not from either one, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what, what do you... What would you say about that? When, when we first got involved with the dialogue activity, I didn't, know, I didn't know a Palestinian. I didn't know anything about Palestinian lives. I didn't realize they were both Muslim and Christian. In terms of being married to Len, who is Jewish, I knew more about the Jewish holidays and the faith, although I never converted myself. I had an appreciation for his background and what that meant to him. But in the dialogue circle, it has a lot more to do with 
the people themselves and where, where they come from in terms of their lives lived, the experiences that they've had growing up, the stories are very, very powerful from pe people who uh, you know, were Holocaust refugees to uh, the Palestinians who lost their homes to, uh, during the Al Nakba. Nakba yeah. And so my heart just goes out for both, for everybody. And because I really believe in the oneness of all of us, our interrelatedness, our interconnectedness, I feel connected to both peoples. I've, I, I can strongly say I'm for both peoples equally. Mm -hmm. And even though there is an imbalance in power mm -hmm. that people struggle with, the ultimate solution has to be meeting the needs of both peoples equally. Mm -hmm. And because I've had the privilege and the, and the uh, ability to meet so many Palestinians and so many Jews from so many different backgrounds with so many different stories, I just, I, I feel really moved by participating in it, you know, and just seeing and praying and hoping that the right thing will happen for all those beautiful people. Thank you. Well, I think this segment is about to draw to a close, and I feel like we just got started. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Uh, if you want to just answer a very brief thing, um, do you feel we're closer to a world without war now? than we were at the start of your work as peace activists. I do. And uh, I feel like uh, the internet is bringing people together. Mm -hmm. There is a whole new breed of young adults who insist on engaging and refuse to be enemies and are not at all interested in that. Our understanding of the inner workings of the human being is greater. Uh, the uh, importance of narrative, the word dialogue, and all the words associated with it are part of the vocabulary around the planet now. And we are experiencing uh, interest from all the continents. And we are definitely closer, and we're moving in the direction of understanding what one, wahad, adin, uno, what that really means. Thank you so much, Libby Troutman, Len Troutman, mm -hmm. and Thank you for watching Marinations.